but the knight's forced march has done the trick. At last, three days after the Romans left their regular route, the forest gets lighter, the land gets flatter. At last, there's a glimmer of hope. The Romans are safe. Open country. If Varus had been counting on Pneumonius's cavalry, he realizes now that all hope is lost. And Arminius makes sure the Romans understand they're still in the trap. Tracing their progress, we can assume that Varus and the remains of his legions moved north on the third day and marched over the Vihan hills until they reached the North German plain. They turn west towards the Rhine. They're marching into a bottleneck just 80 meters wide between the Kalkreiser mountain to the south and a giant swamp to the north. Just a few years ago, archaeologists stumbled on the remains of a palisade wall. Behind these ramparts, Arminius and his men are thought to have waited in ambush for Varus for the final decisive blow. That's what the experts believe. From the earth in front of the wall, they dug up thousands of nails and pieces of lead of Roman origin, domestic objects like scissors, but also spear tips and tools. Is this the site of the last battle? Pride of place goes to a Roman cavalry officer's ceremonial mask. Die Funde von Kalkrise sind zwar sehr zahlreich, aber das Gesamtgelände. Though there are very many finds at Kalkrise, the whole terrain is quite small. And sources tell us of a central event involving three legions and at least 10 to 15,000 men, if not 20,000. So far, the finds at Kalkrise don't reflect those numbers. Even if conclusive proof is still lacking, Kalkrise was soon declared the definitive location of the battle. The museum is a magnet for tourists. Kalkrise's supporters base their case on the dates of the coins found at the site. Nach den bisherigen Indizien Judging by the current evidence, there's a great deal more that argues for Kalkrise than against it. We found coins with Varus's likeness on them. So these coins must have found their way into the ground at the time Varus was governor, that is, 7 to 9 AD. We can be sure about that. The second point is, we found no coins that were minted after 9 AD, among the 1800 or so that we have dug up. Scientists have found traces of a battle along a 10-kilometer stretch of the Vian Mountains. This allows us to reconstruct a clear scenario for the third decisive day. The lie of the land in Kalkrise over the whole area we're working on makes it clear that the Roman army was moving from east to west and that the tribesmen attacked them repeatedly from the lower slopes of Kalkrise Hill. We can demonstrate this over a zone of at least 10 kilometers. We can show that the tribesmen kept harrying the marching Roman army with small-scale darting attacks. When the Romans emerge from the forest and form up in the open, Arminius gathers his men for the final battle. The legions have nothing to counter the tribe's cry of freedom or death. Now they sent victory. More and more tribesmen are going over to Arminius. Even Roman allies like Segestus. 
through opportunism, not conviction. We shouldn't get ideas about the honorable Germanic peoples. That's an 18th and 19th century idea. Archaeology can bring us down to earth here. We see from the battlefield that there was plunder, probably the stripping of corpses. Taking booty was very important. It was an opportunity to enrich themselves with silver, gold, bronze, and even iron. The battle is a victory over the Romans that no one would have thought possible. Close to 15,000 soldiers lie dead in the forest. The few survivors drag themselves across the plain, waiting to be captured and slaughtered. There could be no greater humiliation for the superpower that is Rome. Arminius's victory is unprecedented. Of the Roman historians, it was Tacitus who really understood its significance. Arminius was indisputably the liberator of Germania. Varus would become the scapegoat for the greatest military disaster Rome had ever experienced. He commits suicide on the battlefield. As Paterculus disdainfully comments, this commander had more courage to die than to fight. In the end, he ran himself through. Even after three days of fighting, the bloodshed is not at an end. The victorious tribesmen pass over the battlefield, ripping armor and weapons from the bodies of the dead and dying. They sacrifice captured legionaries to the gods that granted them victory. The standards of the legions are stamped into the mud, and Varus's corpse is defiled. His head goes on a terrible journey to the Emperor Augustus in Rome. If the tribes stay loyal, Arminius can build on his triumph. In his hour of victory, he is the undisputed leader of the Germanic tribes. But will the Romans seek revenge? The short-term result of Arminius's victory was that Augustus abandoned his plans to occupy Germania as far as the River Elbe. That's clear. Augustus had to fight plenty of internal battles, and he had a tough time imposing his policy. Plenty of people in Rome who said, we can't accept this humiliation, we must hit back. But Augustus believed it wasn't worth it. Germania didn't have enough to offer the Romans. The tribes should be left to massacre each other. We'll make sure we always support the weaker side, so they can keep fighting the stronger ones. And we're sitting pretty, and the Germanic tribes are no longer a problem for us. Six years later, in 15 AD, Roman legions return to the site of the disaster.
Tacitus describes the terrible discoveries made by the legions under the command of Germanicus. Bleached bones were lying all over the forest floor. Skulls were nailed to trees. These were the barbarians' altars on which they slaughtered the tribunes and centurions. Almost 2,000 years later, archaeologists in Calprisa discover bones buried in a mass grave. They're all the bones of men. They show signs of violence. They were exposed to the elements for a long time before being buried. Could this be proof that Calcresa was the site of the battle? Perhaps the archaeologists have confirmed the truth of Tacitus' account 2,000 years later. But not everyone is satisfied, and the search for the battlefield goes on. Germanicus failed in his attempt to take revenge, to crush the Germanic tribes. Arminius fought more battles against the Romans and kept them at bay. Germanicus was ordered back to Rome. The superpower withdrew to the Rhine. Germania would never become a Roman province. The Battle of the Teutoburg Forest was one of the most significant of the ancient world. It resulted in a fundamental and long-lasting cultural divide that split Europe in two. Here on the Rhine, where the Xanten Archaeology Park now stands, was a Roman town with temples, an amphitheater and baths. This was a center of antique civilization. On the other side of the river, the Germanic tribes remained what they were, free and volatile. The Germania simply carried on as it had done before the Romans came. Germania was anything but a unified nation. It was many centuries before bigger tribal groupings formed, like the Alemans or the Franks, who were finally strong enough to bring down the Roman Empire in the West. Arminius paid for his ambition of creating a Germanic kingdom with his life. He was poisoned, probably by his own family. Without a common enemy, the land fell back into a state of permanent feuding. No chieftain could tolerate another exceeding him in power and influence. A situation that would characterize this part of Europe until modern times. Das Problem the problem for the kings was always the aristocracy. And that problem lasted in Germany until the reign of Frederick William IV. When he was offered the throne in 1848, he said, yes, but what do the other princes think? He doesn't care what the people think, but he's afraid of his peers, the other crowned heads of Germany. So we can say that this sense of envy, this sense of rivalry with the aristocracy, becomes a permanent factor in Germany. Arminius was long regarded as the German hero. The adoration reached its zenith with the completion of the Hermann Monument in 1875. The sword points towards France, Germany's arch enemy in the 19th century, even though Arminius had fought against Rome. But that doesn't minimize his achievement of challenging and defeating Rome at her peak. But we would know nothing of this hero if his enemies hadn't told his story. It was Tacitus, Rome's greatest historian, who wrote the words that immortalized this barbarian tribe.